Okay. So. Um. It's uh, lecture 11. And maybe before I go on to the lecture, let me just say a few words about the exam. Uh, I guess I'll just get that glove again. Mm. Okay, so um, uh, so we're still grading the midterm. And uh, the solutions will be posted tonight and uh, you'll have the graded exam by Thursday. Um, so I wanna say a few things about the exam. So, um, so the midterm was pretty challenging. It was meant to be challenging. And what I wanna say about that is uh, uh, if you felt, so okay, so the midterm was, was pretty hard, I would say. And um, it was specifically designed to challenge you to think in some creative ways about the definitions. So uh, suppose to uh, to think uh, creatively. And I mean, this is one of the nice things about having a open book exam that it's not about memorizing things and uh, you know part of this is really this is an invitation to what higher level math is like uh, so maybe previous courses you took most of the time uh, there's kind of just a fixed method for solving different kinds of problems and you just execute the method which is something a computer could also do but uh, deliberately many of the questions in this, in this exam were supposed to be unfamiliar and you're you know, supposed to actually try to think about all the knowledge that you have together and, and find a way to solve the question. Um, and the flip side of that is, if you felt confused about something, don't feel bad, okay? So this is, I think one of the problems with the way math is taught that people sort of grow up expecting that if they're confused, then that there's something wrong, that uh, there's something wrong with how they're doing things. Uh, I mean, I'm confused most of the time about the math that I'm doing. Math is supposed to be initially confusing, but confusion really is the doorway to understanding. Uh, so don't feel bad if you were confused. Uh, just use it to identify what you didn't understand. And anyway, you know, on a very practical note, we're gonna we're gonna replace the lower midterm by the exam. So anyway, uh, you know, as far as your grade is concerned, uh, there's plenty of opportunity to recover if you think you, you know, maybe didn't do as well as you wanted to. Um, so that's what I want to say about the midterm. Uh, I many people ask, so there's no homework due this week because no homework was assigned last week, and. Um, uh, one, uh, however, there is a quiz tomorrow uh, about week four, because there was no quiz about that because we had the midterm. So that's uh, that's all I wanna say about the midterm for now. I'm also gonna send a feedback form, uh, a Google feedback form to everybody just to see what how you're doing, what your comments are about the midterm. And uh, one thing we're gonna do during the semester, which, um, it, is uh, we will uh, give you an opportunity to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your GSI in the next few weeks to try to identify you know particular areas where you, where you want to work on things you're confused about, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll get more details about that soon. Okay. So now we are going to uh, begin um, a new section of the course. So, so far, um, uh, we've been doing what I can think of as, you know, what, I, what uh, you could call concrete linear algebra.
And what, what I mean by that is that this is, uh, everything we studied is about objects that you can literally write down. Okay, so for example, a vector is literally an uh, you know array of real numbers, right? An n by one array of real numbers. Uh, and we've thought about you know vectors, a system of equations, uh, you know very concrete things like pivots, which are basically this you know concept that arises from a method to solve linear. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to study what can be defined as uh, abstract linear algebra. Uh, this is, you know, in the book, this is chapter four. And I should mention that my, the way I'm going to present it is a little bit organized differently from how the book is organized. So uh, notes are going to be, I mean, the talk content will be identical, but will be organized slightly differently from the book. Uh, and okay, what do I mean by uh, abstraction? Well, I'll try to give a definition later in the lecture. Um, but uh, I mean, somehow the, the you know the, the theme of what we're going to do is based on can somehow be summarized by this quote of the mathematician Poincaré, uh, who said that uh, mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. Okay, so what does that mean? Let me show you a motivating example where where this quote might make sense. So here's a motivating example. So, so far, uh, you know, what, what have we studied uh, so far? Well, we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, we've talked about vectors in Rn. And if you have two vectors in Rn, then you can add them. You can scale or multiply a vector by a, a number. And if you happen to have a matrix, then you can now define a function from Rn to Rm, the linear transformation of multiplication by A. So that's a function that's a linear transformation. And that has um, some very special properties, namely the key property is linearity. It has the property of TA of, if you have two vectors, X and Y, let's say AX plus BY is equal to A times T of X plus B times TA of Y. So this is all stuff we've learned so far, right? This property is called linearity. So now I want to show you, or I want to draw to your attention, uh, another set of objects that seem to behave very similarly that you've also seen before. And uh, this is now uh, going to be a set of functions. So, so let's consider um, uh, let's consider two sets of functions now. Let's consider the set f. So f is going to be an infinite set. It's a set of all functions from reals to reals, okay? Such that, or actually it's just a set of all functions from reals to reals. Okay, that's a huge set. Maybe it's the first time in your life you thought about such a big set, but it's a well-defined set. Okay, so, so this is all functions from reals to reals. Okay. Uh, and in, you know, here, here's another set. Uh, let's look at the set, let's call the set D. 
This is the set of all functions from reals to reals, which are differentiable. Okay. Now, you have already studied uh, an operation on the set of differentiable functions, namely taking the derivative. So you have this operation d by dx, which takes a differentiable function and outputs some other function. So this is now some kind of a transformation. And what it does is, well, you know, d by dx of some function f is just the function f prime of x. Right, so uh, d by dx, or let me just write it this way, it maps f to the function f prime. And this also has this linearity property. Namely, if you take the derivative of a sum of two functions, or even of a sum of scalar multiples of two functions, then you get a times d by dx of f plus b times d by dx of g. Okay, so these, these look kind of similar. These are not the same thing, right? On the left-hand side, you have vectors in Rn, which are lists of numbers. On the right-hand side, you have sets of functions, which really are not lists of numbers. They're something quite different. And you have an operation that maps, okay, the set of differentiable functions to the set of all functions, namely differentiation, and it obeys the same property. So what we're going to do in the rest of in the next few weeks is we're going to extend our theory of linear algebra to cover what's happened to example on the right hand side. And that's what Poincaré, I think, an example of what he meant when he said giving the same name to different things. So, so, so the key similarity between the most important thing that we have in common in these two scenarios is that you can add and scale or multiply. Uh, well, ob the objects on both sides. Okay, so you can you can add two vectors in Rn and get another vector in Rn, but you can also add two functions defined on the reals and get another function. You and similarly, you can also scale or multiply a function defined on the reals and get another function. And the key point is that these operations of addition and scalar multiplication, uh, uh, you, can, you can add and scalar multiply in both cases, and the addition and scalar multiplication behave essentially the same way, with the same uh, essential the same essential properties. Okay, so what do I mean by same essential properties? So maybe before I get on, get, get to that, any questions about this slide? I'm gonna go in a lot more depth about the example on the right. Uh, would it, yes. Uh, would it be correct to say that a transformation b belongs to the set on the right? Okay, so so, so you're asking if this is a transformation, right? So I'm allowing this to be any function. Okay, so for example, here are some elements inside the set. Sine x, e to the x, absolute value of x. Okay, so a transformation is part of that, but not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not all of it. Uh, well, we, I don't want to use the word transformation because that's going to be reserved for linear transformations. This set contains all kinds of stuff that are the right way to think about it is it's a function, like as in you learned what you learned in calculus. It's a function. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, so let me just say what I mean by these familiar properties and then I'll talk a lot more about this example to make sure we understand it. Um, so uh, let's see here. Mm. 
Okay, so I made, so, so I pre-wrote or at least copied from my notes, this list of familiar properties of addition and scalar multiplication, okay? So addition and scalar multiplication are two operations on vectors. And uh, what I wanna do on this slide is try to capture the essence like what are the key properties of addition and scalar multiplication that are really important? And I'm gonna think of everything else as just as details for right now. So, so here are the important properties of addition and scalar multiplication of vectors. This is also written in the book. You don't have to try to copy this down. So the first is, um, okay, there's an operation called addition. And what addition does is it takes two vectors and it, uh, it outputs another vector, which we're gonna call V plus W. And uh, it has the following property that V plus W is equal to W plus V. This is called uh, commutative. This, this means addition is commutative. The order doesn't matter. It has a property that V plus the sum of W and U is equal to the sum of V and W plus U. This is the associative property. So this is, might as well write this is um, and then there's a, there's a special vector called zero, which has the property that for any other vector, if you add zero to it, you just get itself. So let's call this property zero vector. And uh, every vector has a negative. For every vector v, there's another vector minus v, so that when you add v to minus v, you get zero. So right now, just uh, I'm just listing some properties of vector arithmetic that I hope we can agree on. So, uh, you know, these are properties that we've been using all semester implicitly. And then for scalar multiplication also, okay, given a vector V and a scalar C, there's a vector C times V. And it has these familiar properties that if you have two numbers C and D, C times D, C times DV is equal to CD times V. One times a vector is equal to itself, zero times a vector is equal to zero vector. So I'm just writing down some, what should be obvious properties of vector arithmetic. And then there are these distributive laws that link addition and scalar multiplication. Namely, you can distribute scalar, you can distribute scalar multiplication over addition, and you can distribute scalar addition over scalar multiplication. Okay, so now, so what do I mean by abstraction? Okay, so what I mean by so so what I mean by abstraction is I'm going to now uh, generalize my definition of a vector to be anything that has that satisfies these properties. Okay, so let so so let me call these familiar properties star since I'll be referencing them often. You don't need to remember the individual properties; just think of them as the familiar properties. of vector arithmetic. So um, let's look at, uh, let's go back to our uh, setup. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna define, I'm gonna generalize my definition of a vector. So previously a vector was an array of real numbers. Now it's going to be anything that satisfies the familiar properties. So let me define now what a vector is going to be for the rest of the course. So um, a uh, vector space. is a set. So set is just a collection of objects. And now we're allowing those objects to be anything actually. It's a set 
We'll look at many examples in a moment uh, of objects uh, with uh, two operations. Um, called addition and scalar multiplication. Sorry. So I'm going to write those in red since these are now going to be different. They're not necessarily going to be the same as our notions earlier. So addition is going to take two vectors and output a new vector. And scalar multiplication is going to take a number and multiply it by a vector and output a new vector, um, which satisfy all of the properties star. So star were the properties that were written on that slide, right? The familiar properties. So that's called, that's a vector space. And a vector is just any element of a vector space. So an element of a vector space is called a vector. Okay, so so the, the the intuition is this is any set of objects that you can add and scale or multiply with the familiar properties, right? So intuitive, intuitively, this is now any set of objects you can uh, add and scale or multiply with the familiar properties. And, you know, abstraction is a, is a fancy looking word. People talk about it in philosophy and whatnot, but really, I, I mean, the best, so what does abstraction mean? It's this philosophy of uh, like, you know, margarine and other products that are supposed to replace butter, but, uh, you know, are supposed to be healthier. It's a philosophy that if it tastes like butter, then it's as good as butter. It's butter. Okay. So what I mean by this is if you have something that behaves like a vector, then we're just going to call that a vector. And, you know, sort of the, the, Philosophically, what that's saying is that you, you, you know, you, you, you're now defining objects in terms of their properties. So we define objects solely in terms of their properties. If you've done programming, you're probably familiar with this. If you've done object-oriented programming, but uh, this is the philosophy of this definition, and I'll now show you many examples of vectors for this new definition of a vector. So any questions before we do that? Um, I was wondering if you can give an example of a thing that it's vector in this definition, but... Oh, yeah, yeah, not. exactly. I'm about to give about four or five examples, yeah. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Okay. So, 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 so we... The motivating example is this thing on the right. Okay, so but but before we do that, let's recon let's make sure our new notion of a vector includes the old one, right? So what's example one? Example one is uh, just R n. So this is now a set of objects. It's a set of arrays. That's a set. And to be a vector space, it's a set and two operations, addition and scalar multiplication, which I'm writing in red. So, so what are the operations on this set? Well, uh, the operations are that if you have two vectors, uh, 
then there's a rule for adding them. That's scalar multiplication, which is defined uh, in the way we've been using so far. You just add up each entry. And then, you know, if you have a vector and you have a number, then, then there's a rule for um, multiplying by, by that number. So I'll just put a dot here to emphasize that we're multiplying, though we won't really be writing the dot after this lecture. Um, this is different from dot product, by the way. This is just scalar multiplication. Um, okay, I guess this is not supposed to be read. Um, okay, so these are this is a set, and these are two operations which we've been using all semester, and then th th they have to satisfy the familiar properties. So let's briefly look back at what those were. So the familiar properties were these, right? That the addition has to be commutative, associative. Those are kind of obvious in this case, because that's how you're just doing it to the entries and those properties are satisfied by the entries. There has to be a zero vector and there has to be a negative. So let's check that, okay, let's check that there's a zero vector. So, so there's a zero vector, which is uh, just a vector of all zeros. And with the setup, this satisfies all of the familiar properties. So that's our familiar example. That qualifies as our new definition of a vector, our new generalized definition of a vector. But now the whole point is that this definition also includes a whole bunch of other stuff. So here is another example. It's uh, the set of all functions. So F is the set of all functions from reals to reals. So that's a set. And now I need to define some operations on this, right? So suppose I have one function F and I want to add it to a function G. Well, there's a natural way to do that which we've also probably been doing for a while. Well, this is supposed to be a function. So this is defined as, um, you know, this is a function. So it has to have a value at every X, X in real. This is just defined as F of X plus G of X. So what's the picture associated with this? I mean, okay, what are some examples of things in this set? So for example, the set uh, contains, it contains a ton of stuff, okay? It contains a lot more stuff than any set we've looked at so far. For example, it contains a function sine x. That's a function from reals to reals. It contains a function e to the x. It contains a function x. It contains a function zero. Zero is a function, right? Uh, that just f of x equals zero for every, um, for every x contains all kinds of crazy stuff. It contains the function e to the e to the x. Okay. It doesn't contain, I mean, it doesn't contain everything. I should just mention it doesn't contain, for example, the function one, one over x. Why doesn't it contain that? Um, zero doesn't exist. For the function is not defined at zero, right? So this is not defined on all the real numbers. So it contains a lot of stuff, but you have to check that the function is defined everywhere. Okay, so now this notion of addition, what does it really mean? I mean, for example, um, if I look at, you know, if I, you know, suppose I add the function uh, sine x, so, so, so what does sine x look like? Sine x is a function that looks like this. 
And then I have, let's say, the function, I don't know, x squared, right? That looks like this. So if I add them, then I get a new function, just the function sine x plus x squared. Okay, so I'm now viewing this as a single element of the set of functions, whereas these are now previously were two separate elements of the set of functions. Sorry, these these are upside down. Okay, and now the sum uh, looks like uh, is another function that I guess I'm going to have a hard time drawing it. It probably looks something like this. Right. Literally, what this definition is saying is that for every value, um, for every number x, let's say x is over here, I'm going to, the way I'm going to define its value at that point is I'm going to add up the heights of both of these functions. Okay. So that's our operation of scalar, mo of, of, of vector addition. And now we have an operation of scalar multiplication. So CF of X is defined to be just the function C times F of X. And then we need a zero vector. So the, the zero vector, which I'll underline just to emphasize that it's a vector, maybe I'll underline it in red. Uh, this is the um, this is just a function zero uh, for every x, right? So zero of x is equal to zero. So sorry, x is not a vector anymore. And this satisfies all of the familiar properties. You can check, I mean, you've been doing it in calculus in high school, but this does satisfy our general, our abstract definition of a vector. You know, what it means to taste like butter is that addition and scalar multiplication should have these properties, and they do. So any questions about this example? Um, one quick question. So. I, I see you underlined sad. Does that mean it's like, are you just like uh, highlighting sad or do you mean it's a vector? Oh, sorry. I, I'm just highlighting set. Yeah, I'm, it's set is not a vector. I just mean it's a set. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So not everything being underlined is a vector. I'm what I, the, <laughs> the, 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 the things that are in red are the things that are, are using our generalized notions of addition and scalar multiplication and zero. Okay, yeah. Right, this Thank zero you. is not the same as zero in Rn or the same as zero in a number. It's a zero function. And while I'm at it, I should say equal also doesn't mean the same thing anymore, right? So what does F equal G mean in this setting? Well, it means that they're equal as functions. So the things that are in red are the things that are different from the linear algebra we did before. Any other question? Yeah, what do you, um, why are you bringing up the zero vector? Well, because remember I said a vector space has to satisfy the familiar properties, right? And one of the familiar properties was th that there has to be something called the zero vector that has this property that, uh, you know, any vector plus that vector is equal to itself. And indeed, this has the property that f plus zero. So I guess I should write all these things in red since just to emphasize that they're happening in the new space. So f plus zero equals uh, f. So generally, when we want to check all the familiar properties, we only check for like these three? Uh, okay, so in this course, 
uh, I mean, technically you have to check all of them. Okay. But uh, I mean, real, uh, yeah. Okay. So usually the way this works is in, in the beginning, you or somebody checks all the properties at some point. And then you know that thing is a vector space and you just go from there. It's, um, if I ask you to verify that something is a vector space, yes, you have to check all the properties, but I will not typically ask you to do that. Okay. Thank you. Let's look at another example. So these three examples are among the most important examples in this course, which will appear again and again. Uh, the third example is going to be a set of polynomials in the variable t with real coefficients of, uh, so this is polynomials of degree at most three. Now, so this is the set. And what are the operations? Well, uh, okay, so if you have two polynomials, sorry, let's call them, let's have, say they have coefficients A and B. Then, uh, well, you know, you can add two polynomials and you add them coefficient wise, right? You get another polynomial whose coefficients are the sums of the corresponding coefficients of the original polynomial. And similarly for scalar multiplication also, right? So if C is a real number, then you can, uh, you can multiply it to get a new polynomial. Okay, and again, okay, equality means all the coefficients are equal, I guess, so. And then there's a zero polynomial. So the zero polynomial is just, you know, zero plus zero t squared, plus zero t plus zero t squared, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed these satisfy a star. Okay, so these three definitions, these are three different notions of uh, scalar multiplication and vector addition. This definition is often summarized as entry-wise. So to add and scale or multiply vectors, you just add and scale and multiply every entry. This definition is often summarized by the word point-wise. To add and scale or multiply functions, you just, for every point X, add and scale and multiply the values at that point X. And this definition is sometimes summarized by the word coefficient wise. To add and scale or multiply two polynomials, you just add and scale and multiply the corresponding coefficients. Somebody asked is three special? No, let me just say here. So in general, you can define Pn to be the set of polynomials Uh, of degree at most n. And that's also a vector space. So these are three important examples of vector spaces. And uh, somebody asked a question which we'll get to later because we haven't defined subspace yet. But let me now ask you a question Suppose I define uh, the set uh, W to be the set of uh, polynomials uh, of degree exactly three. So A3 not equal to zero. 
So this is polynomials of degree exactly three. Is this a vector space? So as somebody remarked, you have to check if it satisfies star. So is it a vector space with the same operations? Same coefficient wise operations. Is this a vector space? So I've been saying polynomials of degree at most three. What if I now say polynomials of degree exactly three? Do you think that's a vector space? So you can certainly add and scale or multiply those things, but do you think they have all the properties? No, people are saying no. Can somebody say why? No zero vector. Yeah, there's no zero vector. So the answer is no. So there's no zero vector. And there are various other problems, right? You can add two polynomials of degree exactly three and get a polynomial of degree less than three. So it's not even closed under addition. There are lots of problems, but this is not a vector space. This exactly three. So you need to do that most three. So any questions about these three examples? We'll keep coming back to them throughout the course. So these are three type vector spaces that are different from Rn, or these two are different from Rn. Okay, so now, now that we've defined vectors and we've defined addition and scalar multiplication, the point is we can now actually uh, generalize all of our previous definitions that use addition and scalar multiplication. So addition and scalar multiplication are the basis of all of the definitions that we use. So let's now do that. So, so I'm, I'm doing this deliberately like this, just so you can see that it's, it's, it's a, uh, see the similarities to the previous definition. So here's the definition of a linear combination, right? If V1 through VK and our vectors in Rn and C1 through CK are scalars, then this sum is called a linear combination of V1 through VK with weight C1 through CK. By now, I suppose you're quite familiar with this definition. But now I'm going to generalize this. So if these are now vectors in any vector space, V, and C1 through CK in R are scalars, then the point is I can add and scale or multiply these vectors, right? This definition makes sense in my new generalization because I can add and scale or multiply things in V. So this is called a linear combination of V1 through VK with weight C1 through CK. It's the same definition. And the point is the definition only spoke about scalar multiplication and uh, vector addition. And now I have, you know, those make sense in the case of general V. So this is the definition of a linear combination in a general vector space. So let me now show you an example. Okay, so unfortunately I have to write in red because PowerPoint is not gonna let me change the color, but okay. So for example, here are two vectors in, uh, so sine X and E to the X are uh, vectors in, in F, sorry. F is the vector space of functions. Then, you know, three sine X minus four E to the X, this is also a vector in F. This is a linear combination of the vectors sine X and E to the X with weights three and minus four. Right, it's a sum of scalar multiples of these vectors, which because F is a vector space is itself a vector in F. 
the function that's defined on R, and it's a linear combination of sine x and e to the x. Okay. Um, I should say that not all relationships between functions are linear combinations, right? So a non-example, you know, you can write uh, um, x squared plus one as, you know, the inverse of one plus one over x squared. So it's expressing one function in terms of another function, but this, this is not a linear combination, right? So if this function is f and this function is g, then such a relationship is this is not a linear combination. You're only allowed to use vector addition and scalar multiplication. So f is not a linear combination of g in this case. So that's our generalized notion of linear combination. Any questions about that? So the beauty of this is that this now in one language, we can talk about all these objects like Rn, functions, polynomials, all kinds of other things. That's the power of abstraction. Okay, well, why should we stop here? Here's another definition that you may be familiar with. A set of vectors V1 through Vk and Rn is called linearly dependent if there are scalars, C1 through CK, not all zero, such that the linear combination with these scalars is equal to the zero vector. Well, I'm going to generalize this to arbitrary vector spaces. Now I'm going to replace Rn by any V. And I'm going to say a set of vectors now in any vector space is linearly dependent if there are scalars, C1 through CK and R, not all zero, so that this linear combination, but now has to be interpreted as happening in the new vector space is equal to the zero vector in this new vector space. And linearly independent is this means not linearly dependent, same as before. So let me give you an interesting example of a linear dependence. Or oh, somebody raise their hand, you can please unmute and ask. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question in regards to the zero vector. Is there um, a difference in like why the zero that's in red is different from the zero that's usually just like in black pen? Yeah, so the zero in black pen uh, previously meant zero in Rn, right? Which is a, an, an array with zero, 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 n times, right? I'm, I'm writing it in red to emphasize that this could now be zero in some vector space that's not Rn. For example, it could be the zero function. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, so let's, let's now look at an interesting linear dependence in F, the vector space we've been looking at. So here are three vectors in F. So by one, I mean the function that's just equal to one everywhere, right? So these are three vectors in F. Does anybody know a linear dependence between these? Is there a way to add and scale or multiply these to get to zero? Uh, sine square x plus cosine square x minus one. Exactly. So you may know from trigonometry this identity that sine squared x, so one times sine squared x plus one times cosine squared x, plus minus one times the one function is equal to zero, the zero function, right? So these are linearly dependent. So 
Okay, so notice that linear dependence in F is a very strong statement, right? This is an identity. This is saying this is true for every X, right? And so maybe the comment I want to make is that linear dependencies in F are identities of functions. So this really, you know, it, this is really capturing something that's different from what we did before the first midterm, right? You could not use linear algebra to talk about something like this before. Okay, and maybe let's look at a non-example. Let, let me ask a question. Are uh, the functions sine x and e to the x, these are two vectors in F, are these linearly dependent? Okay, so more than, more than ever, you're gonna have to now really rely on the definitions, right? So another important, in some another almost definition of mathematics is it's it's just talking about things very precisely in a way such that the language kind of works like a machine. So so linearly dependent, the definition means are there some C1, C2, not both zero, such that C1 times sine x plus C2 times e to the x equals zero as functions. Anybody, does anybody know the answer to that? Some people said yes, some people said no. Anyone want to offer a reasoning as to why? Uh, uh, are we allowed to use um, unreal numbers? You're allowed to use whatever you want. Okay. Um, IPy. Um, Oh, okay, okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so th that is indeed a correct proof of the fact that these are not equal. Um, well, I'm sorry, that's a little beyond the scope of this course because I don't think, I don't think we want to talk about what sine of i pi is in this course. So let's stick to real numbers. Actually, no complex numbers. Can you tell me whether such an identity can hold? Okay, so, um, well, okay, there, there are many answers to this and people are proposing some good answers in, uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, but uh, one answer is, um, uh, okay. So, so, so maybe the most, the easiest answer is so. So, so first of all, um, if one of them is zero, the other one has to be zero, right? Because if one of them was zero, then you're just saying, uh, if only one of them is zero, you're just saying the other function is zero, right? So, if c1 sine x equals minus c2 e to the x then sine x equals, let's say, minus c2 over c1 e to the x. And now you observe that uh, this left-hand side, this goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. And this is, this is bounded, right? This is bounded by one. So these can't possibly be equal. There are many ways to prove this. But the point I want to make is you can actually you can't check this using row reduction. Right? This is a statement about some functions. You actually have to use calculus to check this. So it's another new feature now. This is why there's a course on linear algebra and differential equations. That you can use linear algebra to talk about functions and make very interesting statements about them, but then checking those statements sometimes requires calculus. So, so this is impossible. 
so I guess the argument is this: if if this was true, then uh, you know this would happen. That's impossible. So the answer is yes. They are linear. Uh, the answer is no. They are linearly independent. Okay. Why stop here? Let's revisit our definition of span. Yeah, span. So if, if, if. This is the definition of span. The set of all linear combinations of those vectors is called the span. And uh, as you can imagine, we're just going to generalize this like this. If you set a vectors in any vector space, set of all linear combinations, but now taken with respect to the vector space, this is now a subset of V, not a subset of Rn. This is called the span. So for example, here are two vectors in, uh, so one and T are both polynomials in P3. Right, these are both polynomials of degree at most three. Now, what's the span? Well, it's a set of all linear combinations of these vectors. So that actually is something we've seen before. Does anybody recall, what would we call that in the notation we've developed in this lecture? A vector space? Uh, that is a vector space, you're right, but uh, we gave this vector space a name, right? P1, yeah, somebody said this in the chat. There's a set of polynomials of uh, degree at most one. So the span of these two vectors is a set of polynomials of degree at most one. So I want to notice something interesting about this example. The thing I want to notice is that, well, P1 is a subset of P3. And it also has three nice properties, which are some properties that we discussed earlier in the course. The first property is that the zero vector is in P1, the zero polynomial, the zero vector of P3 is in P1, because that's a polynomial degree at most one. And then if you take two polynomials in P1 and add them, so you take two polynomials degree at most one, then the sum is also in P1, right? Sorry, P plus Q. And then, you know, if P is in P1, and you have a scalar C in R, then CP is also in P1. So it's closed under taking linear combinations and it contains zero and it's a subset of P3. So does anybody recognize what kind of object this is? It's a subspace. It's a subspace, yeah. It's the same concept that we did before the midterm, but now in this more general setting of um, sort of abstract vector spaces. So this was a definition of a subspace of Rn. But now again, the same definition works for any vector space. A subspace H of V is a subset with the properties that the zero vector of this V lies in H. If you have two vectors in H, then the sum the sum is now in the V, uh, the sum defined according to V, that's an H, and scalar multiples are in H. 
So for example, um, what we saw in the previous slide, P1 is a subspace of P3. So this was a property that I think many people were confused about before the midterm. R1 is not a subspace of R3 because R1 is not even a subset of R3. But P1 is a subset of P3, right? Polynomials of degree at most one are all in polynomials of at most degree three. So the way to think about a subspace, so this concept actually makes more, is even more elegant when you think about these general vector spaces. The subspace is just another vector space that's contained in V. So H is just another vector space contained in V with the same operations. So it's a vector space in its own right. And if you think about these properties, it's just saying H is a subset of V uh, closed under addition and scalar multiplication. So we saw P1 is a subspace of P3. That was maybe not the most exciting. Let me show you a very interesting example that's very different from what we saw before the midterm. It's an important example. Let's define D to be the set of all functions from reals to reals, which are differentiable. So that means F prime exists. Now this D is a subspace of F, which is a set of all functions. Why? Well, the, uh, the zero, fu zero function is differentiable. Now, if you take two differentiable functions, then the sum is definitely differentiable, right? So that's true. And if you take a differentiable function and multiply it by a scalar, that's also differentiable. So this, so this D is itself a vector space. It's huge, it contains all kinds of stuff. It's nothing like Rn, but it's a vector space. It's a subset of F and it satisfies these three properties. So it's a subspace of F. Can somebody give me an example of a vector that's in F but not in D? Absolute value of X. Absolute value of X, yeah. Right, absolute value of X is a function from reals to reals, but it's not a differentiable function. The first property is just that zero is in the subspace. Zero is differentiable, yeah. Zero function is differentiable. Its derivative is zero. So we've generalized all our notions um, to this more general setting of vector spaces. And you know, sure, we can do that, but really the, the punchline, so let me, um, Um, so we have this new concept of vector spaces and you can define all the familiar, all the same concepts in this new setting. So can define, you know, span, linear independence, subspace, and a bunch of other concepts, which we will do in the uh, general setting. 
but but the punchline, which is is really so it's it's like you know if you watch like Looney Tunes or something, there are these scenes where like I don't know or maybe not Looney Tunes but cartoons, you know where there is like a carpet with a whole bunch of furniture, and someone comes and they just pull the carpet out from under the furniture, and everything stays the same. So the punchline here is that you can that everything we said before about these concepts still works, okay? So ev all theorems about these concepts only uh, depend on these familiar properties of vectors and in particular, this they continue to hold in this very general settings. Okay. Now, the theorems are still true. the The, the proofs are the proofs. There's an important difference in how you can prove theorems in this setting. You, you can't directly prove things using pivots. Okay, so the main difference between abstract and concrete linear algebra from a operational perspective is that there are no more pivots. The only thing you have to rely on are the definitions now. And you can actually prove everything without talking about pivots. Okay, so we will be doing this in the coming lectures and there's a little bit of it on the homework, uh, even on today's homework. If you're not comfortable with it yet, you will be after Thursday. So the main difference is you don't have pivots anymore. But all of the stuff we said previously about span, linear independence, how they're related, will continue to hold for, um, for example, here, here's a simple theorem. Uh, if, uh, you know, uh, V1 through VK in a vector space are linearly dependent, then uh, some VJ is in the span of the previous ones. Okay, this this statement makes sense for general vector spaces, right? We define linearly dependent, we define vectors, we define sum, we define span. So the sentence makes sense. The theorem was true in Rn and it remains true in any vector space. So this is the point of abstraction. We will see I'll give an explanation for why everything is true in the next lecture. But for now, you can at least see that the statement makes sense. This is just an example. There are, of course, many theorems that we learned before the midterm. Okay, so I started the lecture by showing you this motivating example, right? that on the left-hand side, we had linear algebra in Rn, and on the right-hand side, we had some stuff with differentiation that looked kind of similar. And now we're in a position to exactly say what the similarity in the structure is, right? So now we recognize that this F and D are vector spaces, right? Oh, just a second, I have to charge my stylus. Uh, yeah, we recognize that these are vector spaces and you can add and scale or multiply vectors in these spaces. And now we'll now we'll just say what kind of object the d differentiation is. It's a generalization. It's a, it's, it's a linear transformation. So we're gonna generalize our concept of a linear transformation. So let's do that. So I guess item two, is uh, let's define a linear transformation. So um, let me see here. So uh, definition. 
So assume V and W are vector spaces. Um, a linear transformation uh, T going from V to W. So this W is now the domain. This W is the codomain. Is a function. So it's a rule that assigns for every element in the domain an element in the codomain. Uh, such that, or with the properties that, um, for every pair of vectors, let's say x and y and v, uh, t of x plus y equals t of x plus t of y. And for every x and v and scalar c and r, T of Cx equals C dx. So these properties are the same. They're the same as linearity. So this is not a new, it's not a new concept. It's the same concept in a more general setting. And so the, you know, the meaning is that this these transformations preserve linear combinations. And the cartoon is kind of the same, right? There's a domain, a codomain, but now these could be any two vector spaces. And then there's this T that takes, you know, every X in V and maps it to some vector T of X in W, which is the image. So it's the same cartoon, but now we're, the point is this makes sense for these more general vector spaces. So let's look at some examples. Again, it's best to check examples. So uh, let's see. So, well, okay. So maybe example zero is every linear transformation we studied before is a linear transformation, right? So any T going from Rn to Rm uh, satisfies this property. So we didn't lose anything with this new definition. Everything that was a linear transformation is still a linear transformation. The most interesting example for us for this course, and one of the most interesting examples period, is the motivating example. So example, define the linear uh, uh, transformation T going from D to F. Remember D is a set of differentiable functions on R. So that just means the derivative exists everywhere and F is a set of all functions. Uh, by T of F equals the derivative. Okay, so, so let's check the properties, right? Indeed, T of F plus T equals D by DX of F plus T, which now this is a calculus fact, right? Equals D by DF by DX plus DG by DX which now is equal to T of F plus T of G. So that's the first property and the second property is also easy. I won't write it here. So this is a legit linear transformation. The domain of this transformation is D and the codomain is F, right? Now, again, you may wonder why I defined these domains and codomains this way, right? So one question is, why can't I define T going from F to F? Anybody see why? Not all functions are differentiable. Yeah, not all functions are differentiable, right? Here's another question. Why can't I define T going from differentiable functions to differentiable functions? Uh, 
because not all differentiable functions have a derivative that's differentiable. Exactly. Not all functions are differentiable twice. There are functions that can be differentiated once, but not differentiated again. Which are in D, there are functions F, which are in D, but the derivative F prime is not in D. And this might be a good moment to review your calculus after this lecture, if to come up to remind yourself what such a function could look like. So that's why the domain and codomain in this case are important and it's important to define them in this way. But nonetheless, this transformation is linear. Okay. And here's another example. Uh, let's look at a linear transformation from F to R2. By t takes a function f and spits out of now a you know legitly just a good old vector in R two just by evaluating it at two points f of zero f of one. Okay, so that this is now really different from things we've seen before. The input is a function, the output is actually a vector in R two, so just an array of two numbers. And the definition is you just take the function, you evaluate it at zero, you evaluate it at one. So for example, you know, t of e to the x would be the vector e to the zero, e to the one, which I guess is the vector one comma e. Now this is linear. Why? Because let's check the properties, right? So t of f plus t is the vector uh, f plus t evaluated at zero, f plus g evaluated at one, which because of the way addition of functions is defined, this is the same as f of zero plus g of zero, f of one plus g of one. So this is a property of uh, function addition, but now this is equal to f of zero, f of one, plus f of, uh, plus sorry, g of zero, g of one. Which is t of f plus t of zero. Oh, so plus t of g. And property two is also easy. So this is a linear transformation. This, this is sometimes called the evaluation map. So we are going to use these concepts to study differential equations. That's why this course is called Linear Algebra and Differential Equations. And uh, we're going to now, the plan for the rest of the week and maybe next week is to learn linear algebra again. Okay, so, so I personally had to learn linear algebra, I think four times before I really understood it. So I learned it in undergrad, then I learned it in grad school, and I kind of learned it again when I was a postdoc, and now I'm learning it again when I'm a professor. And uh, it somehow each time actually you gain something. Uh, uh, well, and, and this time we're just gonna revisit what we did before the midterm with this new language and see why all the theorems still hold. And the, the punchline is that they now hold in this much more general setting. And that's, you know, that's why linear algebra is so important because it's, it's a pattern that describes a whole lot of different objects uh, all at once. So that's it for the lecture. Um, any questions? How, how would we define a zero vector for this transformation or for this function? So the zero vector is defined for a vector space, not for a transformation. So. So, so, th so this this has its own zero vector, right? So, so there are two vector spaces here, right? F and R two. Yeah. And so the zero in F is the zero function. The zero in R two is this. Oh, so we define them separately for each vector space. Yeah. Oh. So the zero. The definition of zero depends on the vector space. Oh. 
right? So zero is that vector that satisfies these familiar properties star. Yeah. And that oh. depends on the vector space. So the zero vector in F is a function, the zero vector in R2 is this array. And indeed T of zero, the zero function is a vector zero, zero. So that's good because otherwise it wouldn't be a linear transformation. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. But it's a good point. Whenever you write zero in the course, ask yourself, what zero is it? Is it zero the number? Is it zero the function? Is it zero in R2? Is it zero a polynomial? These are all different things. Somebody asked me to go back a slide. Will the other lectures be posted in the media gallery? Uh, no. So unfortunately, I cannot export to the media gallery unless I use a webinar account. So all the lectures are posted under syllabus that were in the regular Zoom, and all the webinar ones are under media gallery. Um, um, will the solutions to midterm one be posted? Yeah, they'll be posted today. OK, thank you. Uh, sorry, why do when you write those broadened versions of the definitions, you stress the plus signs by uh, the what? Yeah, so I stress the plus signs just to remind you that these don't mean the same thing, uh, that these mean different things in different vector spaces. Right? Okay. Like adding functions is not literally the same thing as adding vectors in Rn. In fact, mm -hmm. it's quite different, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I've written these things in red to emphasize that, you know, there is one definition that works for all these different objects, but the details of the implementation of the addition and scalar multiplication are different in all those different vector spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank but you. But still, and you know, the mm -hmm. the linear algebra, the statements in linear algebra work for all of them. That's that's somehow the point of this abstraction. Mm -hmm. And. For the like, why for the uh, sorry for how to, for the like why for the P three that like is that the degree smaller or equal to three or just exactly equal to three? It's a smaller than equal to. In fact, in the bottom of the slide, we discussed why if you do polynomials of degree exactly three, it's not a vector space. Yeah, and you say you says like the there there's no zero vector in this one. Yeah, because the zero vector has degree zero, right? Uh, so okay, you're right. You would have to prove that no other vector has this property, which requires a proof. Okay. Uh, but here's a simpler, uh, you know, reason why it's not closed under addition. Let's take the polynomial t cubed, and let's add it to the polynomial minus t cubed, right? Mm -hmm. So these are both in this set W, they're degree exactly three, right? Yeah. When you add them, you get zero and that's not in W. Uh, okay. So, the, so we can't even define these operations, right? If you look back to the essential properties star, uh, you know, the, 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 the first one was that, you know, if you add, if you have two vectors and you add them, you get a vector, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not happening in that example, so it's not a vector space. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yep. that's clear. Thank you. Yep. Any other 